some time for a quick Q&A. Jerry, take it away. Well, thanks, Paul. And thanks to everybody for, you know, opting into my session and listening to what I have to share, which is from the heart and from the experience uh, that I have. In fact, let me just kind of tell you when it comes to this topic, where does my uh, perspective come from? Well, it comes from work. And if you had asked me at the start of my career way back in the early 80s, um, Jerry, what are you looking for and what matters to you? I would not have listed culture because I didn't know any better. I would have listed things like salary and benefits and location and things that probably many of our students seem to care a lot about, as they should. But over the course of years, and, and generally what I've learned is that you, you have a deeper appreciation for culture, corporate culture, when you've been in a bad one. <laughs> Sometimes you take for granted the good ones that you're part of. So mine comes from experience. That is the source material for my presentation. And I should also add that you know, my co-author and I, Mary Beth Kuzmeski, we have taken this culture topic and tried to distill some of the really key parts and principles of it into chapter 15 of the text we co-authored, which came out late last year. So if you are interested in taking a look at the whole text or just the culture chapter, which is chapter 15, um, please feel free to do that. And I would love to have any feedback you might want to share on that or on this topic or anything else. So let's talk about, as we should, what are some of the learning objectives here? Well, my hope is that as we go through the material this morning, that you'll understand how I view corporate culture. I would love to know if it differs from your view. Uh, you're gonna hear me talk about why I think it matters so much. And I wanna share some key truths about culture that I've kind of amassed over my almost 40 year career now. And then I want to end things by giving you a tool that you can use to assess culture. And I will tell you, it's kind of a work in progress, but I'm, I'm pretty pleased so far with this online assessment tool I've created. So that's what I hope we all get out of our session today. And so I think the best place to start is with a definition. What is culture? And so you can see on the screen, there's a formal definition. But informally, really, we think of culture as the way things happen, how stuff gets done. So if you look at the formal definition, what you don't see are the words rules and policies. And it's worth taking a look at why. So most organizations do have plenty of official rules and policies for things such as employee standards for dress and conduct. And while those things might exist in the HR handbook, they really aren't necessarily part of the culture. Sometimes they get ignored uh, and employees are pretty savvy. They learn which of the rules and policies are real and which ones just exist on paper and are not enforced. And management may look the other way on some things and that in and of itself is part of the culture. So let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. And uh, I'm gonna go back to my early career. I spent the first 10 years of my career at IBM. I was in the sales and marketing organization. And back in that day, I understand it's changed since then, but back then the traditional dress code was a white dress shirt. This was for men. Uh, usually it was a button down uh, dress shirt with a dark suit and a tie and often black wingtip shoes. That was just the uniform. So I was very early in my uh, employment stint at IBM. And for some strange reason, I still don't really understand. I decided one day, you know what? I'm gonna wear a blue shirt to work. And I did, and I regretted it. The entire day, I was subjected to lots of good natured ribbing. I don't mean just a little, I mean from everybody about wearing the wrong color shirt. So I got the message. Uh, the blue shirt stayed in the closet from that point on. And the truth is there was no official dress code, nothing in the handbook about wearing a white shirt, but it was a really strong tradition, which was part of the culture that all the members of the IBM tribe enjoyed complying with. And I wanted to be part of the tribe. So that was part of the culture that I quickly learned and adapted to. 
So, so that's kind of what culture is at a high level. We'll, we'll kind of unwrap some more ideas about culture. But what I'd like to do next is let's go into why does it matter? And I want to give you some examples. And so the first one's going to come from Airbnb. So in 2013, this company landed $200 million of funding. And one investor in particular, one individual contributed $150 million of that. So the CEO asked that particular investor, what is the single most important piece of advice you have for us? Seems like a great question to ask someone who wrote a check that big. And you might think that that investor would say, well, Brian, you know, you got to pay close attention to the gross margins. Or you need to make sure you've got a really killer marketing strategy in place. Got to do those things. It's not what he said. He said something else. In fact, I'm going to put a modification of the quote up on the screen. His response was, don't foul up the culture. Okay, the truth is he used a different word than foul, but we're going to keep it family friendly in this presentation. And I think it's fascinating that this individual, on the basis of what he perceived to be a strong culture that was worth protecting, was also willing to write such a big check to make an investment in Airbnb. And so culture matters. It does make a difference. And that's not the only example. I want to share another one. I love this example because the young lady you see in this LinkedIn post, Allie, is a former student of mine. So she graduated and has gone into her professional career and we're connected in LinkedIn. And I just happened to look one day and saw that Allie, uh, who is a recruiter for a company, had put a poll up. And I was fascinated because look at the choices, right? One of them was culture, which is very near and dear to me. So I responded to the poll so I could see the results. And there you have it. Number one, far and away, is culture. So it matters uh, any way you want to look at it, all the way around. Culture makes a big difference. So there's a few realities that I want to kind of preface some of the truths I'm about to share with you that I've learned over my career. So some of those are simply this. Culture, it's kind of hard sometimes to really fully appreciate because it's not on the balance sheet. It's this intangible thing. And for that reason, it kind of gets overlooked. Um, and maybe we don't pay as much attention to culture as we should. My opinion is we need to talk about culture in all of our business classes. We need to indoctrinate our students about, look, Culture matters more than almost anything else. When you leave this place with your degree, you definitely want to get a nice paycheck. But I tell my students all the time, there is not a paycheck big enough to make you want to stay in an organization with a terrible culture. So that's why I have so much passion around this topic. If you look at companies that are really successful, one of the things you're going to see is culture is the X factor in their success. So again, I know I'm probably preaching to the choir to use an expression when I say these things, but um, these are things that uh, I wish I knew uh, decades ago when I started my career, but, but now I fully appreciate. So these are some of the truths about or realities about culture. What I wanna do now is I wanna share a real life episode from my career. So, you can see on the screen an email header. I, I literally saved, in fact, I'm, I'm gonna show it to you right here. Well, it's not very, folks, very well. I saved a hard copy of this email. That's how big a deal it was to me. So here's the setup. This is an email that was sent out on a Friday morning in the summer, and it came from the CEO, and he sent it out to everybody. It was one of those group all or group everyone email messages, and it was, an organization I was working for at the time had about 600, maybe 650 employees, so kind of a medium-sized company, and um, the workforce composition, roughly a fourth, maybe upwards to a third of the employees were part-time or hourly wage or some combination of the two. So, so there's your setup. So let's take a look at this episode because I'm going to ask you a question when I share this with you about what would you do? Okay, 
So let's just go to the actual email message. Now, I, I apologize. I scanned it. So it's probably small and maybe hard to see. Get close to the screen if you need to. But this is what it was. It was very simple. The CEO just feeling great about things on a Friday morning, wanting to you know, spread some good cheer to all the employees, share some kind of adages, some pithy sayings. And you can look at this, right? He's, he's like... Um, just good advice, grandfatherly type stuff. Once you settle for second, that's what you're going to get. The impossible is the untried. If you can laugh at yourself, you'll always be amused. Discipline yourself. Others won't have to. And then the last one, finally, dance like nobody is watching. You know what? I, I still can't do that. It doesn't matter if no one's watching. I, I, I can't do that part of it very well. But nevertheless, this was just what was on his heart. He wanted to share this. So he did. So what happened? Oh, at the bottom of the message, he says, thanks for all your hard work and just kind of, you know, motivational, inspirational message. Well, so happens that we had one of those part-time hourly wage employees decide to respond. And yes, this individual did a reply all. Now we can stop right there. And I bet all of us have stories about, oh, never do a reply all to a group everyone email message. That's just dangerous. Well, you know what? This young man didn't know that. <laughs> he, he hadn't learned that lesson. Um, so he just, what was on his heart. And, and so his responses are in bold on the screen. And if you look at them, they're, they're a blend of kind of deep thoughts and snarkiness, right? So he's, he's like, um, you know, giving some response to this message about adversity. He's saying when we refuse to settle for second and get it anyway, we failed. Like, wow, there's some kind of deep thoughts here. Um, and he goes on and on and on. And then finally, the last one, you know, dance like there's no one watching. And he adds, because soon there won't be, <laughs> which I had to laugh at that one. And then he kind of closes it out by saying, keep smiling. Cynicism is only negative when we perceive it as such. So and but but then he had to add as his you know salutation at the end all my love and kisses and he put his name which I have redacted <laughs> all right so wow everyone read this message and we were like what is going to happen now well I'm going to tell you what what happened but first it's your turn this is a cultural test that's what this was for this organization and specifically for the CEO so. You can feel free to put a response into the chat. And Paul, I would ask you to monitor that and kind of tell me what the winning choice is here, A, B, or C. A is simply you ignore it, do nothing, just chalk it up to, you know, someone else having fun with an email on Friday. You could fire the employee or you could counsel the employee. And I added an asterisk because these part-time employees, they were never taken through training on how to use the corporate email system and what proper email etiquette was. So, so what's your choice? What's the right thing to do here? And as you think about it, I'm going to reemphasize, this is a cultural test because everybody is watching what will happen. And we're going to learn from it as a company about the culture we have and how we respond and how we treat people and what we value, right? So, um, Paul, hopefully we've had a few people make some responses. What, what is the winning response so far? It's unanimously C. Okay, unanimously C. You know what? And, and if you had come to me, I would have said the same thing. So what actually happened? Well, here you go. Yes, I'm sorry to say the real life situation here, this employee was fired and not quietly. I mean, within an hour, this employee was snatched up out of his seat, shown the door and, and gone. And everybody knew it. Everybody knew it. Think about the impact that has. I, I believe the CEO felt that all he was doing was just teaching a lesson to this employee who dared respond like this to his group, everyone email. But what really happened was it impacted the entire workforce. How do you think if you were part of this company and you were asked in an email to be candid, how would you respond? You know, what this did was it created a culture of teaching people, 
play it safe. Don't stick your neck out. Don't take risks. Don't speak your mind. And that's that's really not what an organization needs to be healthy. So anyway, this had a big impact on me. Um, uh, obviously, I, I kept the email because I just wanted to always be reminded of this. So anyway, thank you for your, your input on that. What I want to do now is go through some of the truths that, you know, through incidents like that one and others in my career, I've kind of developed these eight things that I think are really true. And keep in mind, these are just from my experience and opinion. I didn't go out and do, you know, peer reviewed research to figure this stuff out, but I just have found it to be true. So if you will, let me walk you through the eight things I have learned over my career about culture that I would love for us to teach our students. So here's the first one. Simply every organization has a culture. And by that, I mean, there's not a vacuum when it comes to culture. So it doesn't matter if you're a corporation, a nonprofit, a sports team, a religious group, a political party, a school, or a club, there's never a void of culture. And you look at organizations and see that many of them are very intentional about their culture. They know it's important and they know it influences. So they actively work to instill it and grow it and make it really a competitive advantage. Then there are some organizations, they recognize, you know, we've got a culture, yes, but we're just gonna kind of let it evolve as it will. We're not gonna try to direct it. We're not really gonna try to nurture it any or strengthen it or exploit it to everyone's advantage. We're just gonna have it, that's it. And still there are other organizations that are willfully ignorant of their culture. They fail to use it as a lever to inspire their team, to propel the organization forward. So they're either unaware of it, they ignore it completely, or they just think it's not important. And so those organizations, if they have a culture, it's likely to not be a very good one. But truth number one, everyone has a culture. So I've got some assessment questions that you know I recommend to the organizations I actually consult with what should you ask yourself? Well, here on the screen is what is your organization's culture from the leadership's perspective? What do you think it is? And then how intentional have you been in building it? Those are good assessment questions around that first truth. So let's look at the second truth. And that is you, the leader, determine what the culture is. That cultural direction for any organization is set at the top. So whether you're the CEO, the president, teacher in the classroom, coach, director, dean, captain of the team, any other leader, you have the greatest influence in determining the culture. So you can see on the slide, you know, I've got a whole list of things here you can outsource, a lot of businesses have, um, but one thing you can't outsource is you can't outsource the culture and good leaders know that. They recognize that their role is to constantly model the culture, nurture it, promote it and get buy-in. And they're pretty good about casting a compelling vision, building a value-based culture to achieve that vision. And so that process of doing that, it includes identifying what the key elements are of the culture, measuring the acceptance and adoption of the culture, managing it. And the goal isn't just to make it a better place to work. Yeah, you're probably going to get that but it's to engage the employees and to drive performance. And that trickles all the way down through customers, which we'll talk about some more too. But truth is leaders, they don't have the option of outsourcing this function. And the ones that fail to realize that they're responsible for culture don't understand that the rest of their team still looks at them for direction and insight about the culture and how to behave. So I've got some assessment questions too on this particular point. Um, where is culture building on your list of priorities? Hopefully it's there. And what kind of metrics or KPIs do you use as an organization to help you monitor cultural understanding and adoption? So, uh, by the way, when we get to the end of this, I'm going to share a tool that I created with Qualtrics that you can actually use to do this assessment for yourself or with another organization. All right, let's look at truth number three. And Paul, hopefully I'm doing okay on time. So if, you, if I need to speed up, let me know. Um, here's truth number three. The culture is what employees say it is. So yes, I just said that leaders are the cultural architects for their organizations. 
And in their minds, they uh, have created a culture that is solid gold, hence the imagery on the slide. But you know what? Employees, they are truly the assayers of culture. They determine whether the culture they're part of is real or fool's gold, which is what you see on the right. And they are very keen observers. And so they're going to compare and contrast the words they hear about culture and the actions of the leadership to determine if it's genuine, if it's real, if it's worthy of adoption. So this particular truth you may think contradicts the one I just shared about the leader determines the culture. But what this really means is that employees watch and listen carefully to how the leadership models the culture. And leaders who say one thing, but then do another are really telling their teams, you know this culture stuff, it's not for me, it's for you. And leaders who only talk a good culture game, what they risk is losing the respect the buy-in and the engagement of their teams. Culture isn't just something that leaders can talk about. It is what they do. And anytime there's an inconsistency between the two, employees are gonna get confused and then they're gonna be left to their own to try and interpret the culture and figure out what it means. And that's not really a good thing. It usually leads to suboptimal performance, some disillusionment, some morale problems, and ultimately to employee turnover. And never then right now has there been a time where employee retention has been more important. So these impacts are not confined to employees. It spills out and trickles down and splashes over onto customers when we have these kinds of cultural problems. So anyway, that's the third truth. I do have some assessment questions you see on the screen. You want to know what the culture is? Go ask the employees. What do they say it is? And hopefully the culture is safe enough to let them speak candidly about that. How aligned are what the employees' views of culture with the leadership views? And what are the gaps? And usually there are some. They may be small. In some cases, they may be big. But you need to know what they are. The fourth truth is culture is modeled, not decreed. Organizations will be very careful and thoughtful about documenting their culture, and they'll make it easy to reference and share. That's a very good thing. In fact, Netflix puts its cultural manifesto on the jobs page of its website, where it's really easy for everybody, prospective employees, the public, anyone to find. So it's really good for organizations to formally communicate the culture, but remember words have less impact than action. So you can say what you want on the culture poster in the break room, and it's meaningless if management and leadership actions don't match up. So the actions are always gonna trump the words. So for example, let's go back to Netflix. One of their core kind of philosophies, a piece of their culture is people over process. That's great. And the culture webpage specifically says the firm will, quote, encourage independent decision making by employees. Again, very good. These are great words. But should a Netflix employee ever see a manager rebuke an employee for doing just that very thing, the team is going to quickly conclude, you know what, the words are not real. It's going to undermine the culture. So we should definitely communicate our culture very publicly and formally. Um, and a poster in the break room is fine, sure. But recognize that when we do that, we, we're not just trying to communicate to our team what the culture is. We are creating accountability for ourselves. And I think that's a very good thing. We just have to recognize that if we're going to make a promise about the culture, we've got to fulfill it. So some of the questions I think organizations or we could ask about the organization we're part of to help assess it are these. How well is the culture being modeled by leaders? What are the disconnects you know, between what's said and what's being done? And then how are leaders, managers, faculty, whoever it is being held accountable for complying with the culture? So. Again, just ways we can kind of help understand where we are on this whole culture spectrum. Uh, another truth is culture is never benign. So unlike 
famously neutral Switzerland, culture isn't ever benign. It's never a neutral influence. It's always going to create either lift or drag. So if you're a leader of an organization, never let yourself believe that just that you don't have a culture uh, and therefore you're not going to be impacted by the possible negative effects of a culture. No, you have a culture and it is impacting you, whether you are managing that or not. So there are certainly degrees to the positive or negative impact, depending on the strength of your culture or the level of organizational dysfunction that may exist. But culture's impact is always going to be felt and strong. Healthy cultures are powerful, unifying influences that can lift the entire organization. Uh, leaders that know this are going to invest heavily in time to personally model and communicate their culture to ensure that it links to the vision and values they have for their companies and that it permeates every part of the organization. But by contrast, organizations that neglect their culture, they often have poor ones. And when culture is a low priority, leaders often fail to realize that it's creating a tremendous amount of drag, pulling the organization down and limiting its success. So some of the assessment questions I recommend around this truth is, how is your culture generating lift or drag in your organization? Go look for specific ways and examples of that. Another truth is culture differentiates. And it differentiates through the impact it has first on employees. That impact, positive or negative, is going to be felt by customers, by students, by our stakeholders, whoever they are. So companies with strong, healthy cultures, they get loyalty. Um, same thing's true with any organization, whether it's a corporate entity, a nonprofit, a university. Strong cultures generate loyalty. Employees have high morale. They love working for whatever brand that is. They will go the extra mile to serve their constituents, and to serve each other. And customers, students, stakeholders feel and value that difference. And those companies with these strong cultures have recruiting advantages because they are by default preferred employers. They compete really well for whatever talent it is they need because people want to go work there. So the outcome of really strong cultures for these companies is you get a highly talented, highly motivated, highly engaged workforce, and they deliver great experiences for whoever it is they're serving inside or outside the company. So that's how they get such a good advantage. And it's one that is sustainable and highly competitive. It sets them apart. But we got to remember the inverse is also true. If you have a company with low morale and uh, a bad culture, but you expect your employees to paint a smile on their face and provide outstanding service, you are kidding yourself. It just doesn't work that way. So some of the cultural assessment questions here you see on the screen, you should look at morale. You know, that's that's a great KPI cultural indicator. Um, you should look at attrition, understanding what's happening with you compared to the rest of the industry and, and ask yourself, who is the preferred employer in our segment, in our territory, in our industry? Those are all good things to evaluate. Uh, we're getting close next to the last truth before I go into the last part of my session here is this, it's hard to change culture because culture is kind of like your personality. It's very deeply ingrained in the organization and the people who curate that culture. So changing it, even subtly changing it, it's hard because you know what kind of change it requires? Attitudinal change. Then it requires repetitive communication to educate and justify whatever changes you're trying to make culturally. So the leaders have to, again, consistently model those changes to everyone, and it's not a fast process. So you think of major personal changes that we go through ourselves, whether it's changing religions or political parties, something like that. Those kind of things are not like flipping a switch. They don't come quickly or easily, and, and that's how it is with changing corporate culture. 
great leaders, they have awareness of when they need to change their culture. And so they'll initiate changes. Ineffective leaders, they don't see a need to do it, even when everyone around them is experiencing the dysfunction of the culture. So when it's bad, when that happens, what, what I've seen and been part of, middle managers can try and create a cultural oasis inside an otherwise dysfunctional culture. They can do that within their own department, but it's really hard to fully insulate an, an, everyone on a team from the negative effects of the culture that surrounds them. And so here's kind of one of the hardest truths I think of all, is when the culture's bad and it needs changing, often what has to happen to change the culture is you have to change the leadership. Sometimes that's the only way. So an assessment question here, or a couple actually is, is the current leadership in place at an organization a catalyst or a barrier to healthy cultural change? And how is culture itself introduced into decision-making, large and small ways? You know, culture really ought to be an influence on just about every single decision that gets made. So how does that happen? That's the assessment question. Okay, the last truth I wanna share before I wrap up is this one. Culture isn't built in a day. It can take years to build a culture. And it can take just a day to destroy. Um, just like the images on the screen, today's strong culture is the mighty oak tree on the right that 20 years ago was just an acorn. And it's something we, we plant, we nurture for years and get it to grow into something impressive and something useful, but through recklessness or carelessness, it can come down in a day. So the mission to build and reinforce culture is constant. It's ongoing. It's something leaders are always focused on. The CEO can't expect to just give one speech to the troop. The dean can't just you know, have one really well-worded email go out to everybody and think that we accomplish the culture building mission. No, it requires effort every day, all the time. Um, managers should use culture as a filter. Leaders use culture as a filter for the things we say and do. We have to live it out, not just in the big decisions, but as I said, in the small ones too. And we have to model it in a sustained, consistent way because that's how culture grows and becomes real over time. Every single time there's a cultural lapse in an organization that gets overlooked and not dealt with, it sets the organization back. It is swinging an ax to the trunk of the culture tree and it requires damage control and often culture rebuilding if we don't deal with cultural lapses. So giving people a pass on the culture, it is the functional equivalent of swinging an ax at the base of the tree. All right, so what are some assessment questions here? How do leaders consistently model culture? How do we recognize employees for being great cultural ambassadors, representing the culture well? And what happens when there are cultural lapses? Do they get dealt with and how do they get dealt with? All right, so those are the truths. Um, I wanna just put a list up of things that generally are pretty good indicators of healthy culture. Um, ideally, all of these things are there. Going back to the example about the CEO email at the very beginning of my session today, number five on this list was missing. There was no grace at all and how that poor employee was dealt with. So if you've got these things going for your organization or any organization you, you advise, then they're probably doing a pretty good job on culture. So now what? Well, I wanna share with you uh, a tool. So there's a, a URL on the screen. I built a cultural assessment tool in Qualtrics. And I think Paul is gonna send out this link because this is a little bit tricky. It's a shortened link, the last uh, character of this link is a lowercase l. It's not a cap, capital I, it's not a one. But, but I built this assessment tool and actually to his credit, Stu Draper at Stukent has taken my assessment tool. I've had lots of other leaders and organizations take it as well. And so if you take it, here's kind of the scale to interpret your results. If you score between 75 to 100, you can be pretty certain your culture is healthy and strong from your perspective. 
50 to 74, you got more lift than drag. There's a few issues that probably need to be dealt with. Then if you score 25 to 49, you've got about as much drag as you have lift. The issues are now at a moderate level in terms of dealing with them. And then if you score less than 25, you've got far more drag than lift. You've got some pretty serious issues affecting employee morale, attrition, customer satisfaction. So I would welcome having any of you take this and giving me feedback on it. I, I want this to become a tool that organizations can use to understand pretty quickly how their culture is. And my vision is to have leaders take the assessment tool and then have um, non-management employees take it and compare the two. So I'm, I'm, that's where I'm headed with this thing. Um, you can assess your culture. And, and I tell companies I work with, look, you, you need to identify out of this assessment or whatever assessment you can do, ways to improve your culture. Always work on improving it and identify and track some metrics like customer satisfaction and churn are indicators. Employee engagement and attrition are indicators. And I, I tell students and I tell employers that I work with, look, go read about either the company you're thinking about working for or your own company on Glassdoor. What are current and past employees saying about you. Some of it's hard to read, but you need to read it. You need to understand how you're viewed. So, uh, okay, wow. I've, uh, I think I've come to the end, hopefully with a few minutes to spare. I would love to collaborate, love to get feedback. I think we have time for some questions. Please connect with me on LinkedIn if you care anything about this topic. Um, Paul, I think, that's what I have to say, but what does someone else have to say? Great, thank you, Jerry, that was awesome. Um, I'm excited to take your assessment. Um, I think that that's definitely something we should do here at Stukent. Um, if anyone has any questions, go ahead and put them in the chat. We've got a couple minutes left and we can um, ask Jerry, or if you just have a, a, a takeaway or an insight that you'd like to share. Um, while we're waiting, I'll, I'll share one of mine. I thought that it was just so interesting that it was these cultural experiences from, from early on in your career that you've remembered after all these years. You know, a lot of times we're not going to remember like if we didn't get a project done on time or uh, we didn't meet, meet a revenue goal for a certain quarter, but, but you, you proved that those cultural moments, they stick with us. And I think that's really important. And it reiterates what you were saying. And I thought it's worth adding. I, I've collected a pretty good sample size already through this cultural assessment tool. The mean score is 43, wow. if, if you care. And so if you go back, that, that, that's, that means a lot of the organizations who've taken the assessment, they've got some room for improvement. Yeah, cool. Um, one of the things Stu Draper mentioned in his, um, in his speech this morning that he interviews all full-time employees at Stukent, and his purpose of the interview is it is a values cultural-based interview. Uh, he's set that standard for Stukent, and he wants to make sure that everyone who's hired um, that he believes that they can live up to it. Um, we do have a question here from Nancy. Um, she says, how does purpose play into culture? You know, that's a great question, Nancy, because you know, purpose and values and culture are all kind of intertwined together. So, um, you know, I, I think that purpose is part of the culture because I'm thinking back to a book Daniel Pink wrote called Drive, and there's a subtitle to it. Some of you may be familiar with it, but Daniel Pink talks about that. And, and he says that to engage employees, which should be you know, one of the primary goals and functions of culture, they have to have work with purpose. And they, if we don't provide them with purpose through their work, we're probably not gonna keep them very long, or if we do, they're not gonna be very engaged with what they do for us. So it's critically important, um, but I don't have just a simple answer or formula that says, and the way you do that is, you know, that's, that's a function of lots of different things, but it is critically important. And I really appreciate you asking that. Great. 
Um, looks like Jackie said, great session. An interesting research project would be to look at cultural within an industry, culture within an industry, like luxury in which company legacy heritage history is important for the customer. That would be a great research project. Great. All right. Well, thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, I just want to talk about